If you are already on Medicare or are considering going on Medicare, you have to know exactly what your costs are going to be. So in this video, what I'm going to do is show you the Medicare Part B premiums and deductibles for 2023. The majority of people that go on Medicare go on Medicare when they are turning 65. Now, not all will start Medicare at 65, but that's when most people are going to be eligible. And we're eligible for Medicare because we have paid into the Medicare tax system for at least 40 quarters, which is basically 10 years worth of work. Now, most of you watching this have far more than 40 quarters, but we have to have at least 40 quarters. If we don't have that on our own work record, we can get that either from an existing spouse or possibly an ex-spouse or a deceased spouse. But we turn 65, we're eligible for Medicare. Now, there are some people that are actually under 65 that qualify for Medicare, and that's because they're receiving Social Security disability benefits. And whenever someone's receiving Social Security disability benefits for 24 months, on the 25th month, they're automatically enrolled into Medicare A and B. Uh, those who have Lou Gehrig's disease or those who have end-stage renal disease also are Medicare eligible. Now here in just a minute, I'm gonna get into the details of the Medicare Part B, but I think it's important to note that when we talk about Medicare services, there are actually two parts to Medicare. Part A is everything that would be inpatient type services. This would be when you're admitted to the hospital or to a skilled nursing facility for inpatient rehab. The B of Medicare, which is the focus of our video, is everything that's gonna be on an outpatient basis. So outpatient services, this would be labs, uh, outpatient surgery, those types of things, as well as all doctor services. Uh, doctors, uh, whether that's a doctor that you see in their office uh, or uh, they treat you in the hospital, it is the B of Medicare that always pays the doctors. So surgeons, anesthesiologists, ER doctors, hospitalists, uh, your primary care doctors, your specialists, all paid to the B of Medicare. And then lastly, what's paid through uh, Part B is what is called durable medical equipment. And this would be CPAP machines and auction equipment and scooters and wheelchairs and walkers and beds in the home and diabetic supplies. But all those things are also going to be paid through the B of Medicare. So A, pretty much everything inpatient, B, everything on the outpatient basis, as well as doctor services. Now, once we've decided that it is time to go on Medicare, whether it's 65 or beyond, we have to enroll into Medicare following the right to a period of time as well as the process. And so if someone's going to start when they turn 65, what will happen is they are coming into Medicare during what is called their initial enrollment period. And so this would be anyone that's on a retiree plan, a COBRA plan, an Affordable Care Act plan, uh, anyone that's on TRICARE insurance, or maybe they have no insurance, uh, they have to come in at 65. Or by the way, if you're in a group that has 19 employees or less in it, meaning you're, you have a company covered plan, you or your spouses, but there's only 19 employees or less, you've got to go on to Medicare in that scenario at 65. So we have to do it during what's called the initial enrollment period. So let's just suppose, as an example, uh, today is 1-11-2023, um, uh, uh, okay? And let's just say that someone is turning 65 today, right? So that means uh, their birthday uh, was 1-11-1958, and they're gonna start their Medicare at 65. Their initial enrollment period lasts for seven months. And so they can start Medicare now, 1-1-23, uh, and they can enroll uh, as, as during a seven month window. And so those seven months are three months before, three months after. And if I enroll during the first three months before my 65th birth month, I would start in January. But if I enroll in January, they start me February, 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 they start me March, March are going to start me in April, and then the last month I can enroll during this period of time would be April, and then of course they would start me May 1. So the month that you choose to enroll determines when your coverage is going to begin. And so if I have to start at 65, I have this seven month window to start, depending upon when you want those benefits to begin, will determine when you actually do that enrollment. Now, though we are eligible for Medicare at 65, not everyone has to start Medicare at 65. Uh, we're eligible, but some people are going to start being beyond 65. In other words, they their spouse uh, are still working. They're covered by an employer provided plan that is better than their Medicare option. So they're going to delay taking Medicare until a later date. So let's just say they're going to put it off for two years and they're going to start at age 67. Now they can't use that initial enrollment period because uh, that's long gone. It only lasted seven months. So now we have an, another enrollment period called an SEP. This stands for a special enrollment period or a special election period. And so what we have to do here is we can come into Medicare 
Medicare with no penalties and no problems, but we are required to prove that we've had credible insurance coverage through an employer plan. Again, it could be your plan at work or your spouse's plan, but we have to prove that. And so this SCP requires that we go back all the way to age 65 and prove that we've been working and covered by a group plan. The way we prove that is with a form called an L-564. And that L-564 is a request for employment information. It's a CMS form. And uh, the HR department or someone within your company that has the employment records that can prove that you're working and prove that you were uh, uh, insured uh, by that work plan, uh, they would complete that form. And then we add to that a form called a 40B. And all a 40B form does, it just simply says, this is when I'm going to start my Medicare. So if my group plan is going to end June 30, I want my Medicare to start 7-1. I prove that I'm eligible uh, through credible coverage with the L-564. And then on that form, I'd put, please begin my Medicare uh, July 1, whatever year you're going to begin. So these two forms are required to come in if we're going to use that special enrollment period. They're not required if I'm going to start during my initial enrollment period, but they absolutely are required during the special enrollment period. Now that we have a basic understanding of those essential elements of Medicare, now let's talk about really the, the gist of our video today, and that has to do with Medicare premiums. What is it going to cost us to be on Medicare? Okay, so first off, we said Medicare had two parts. A and B. A, for most people, 99% of the Medicare population, the inpatient side, the hospital side, has a zero premium for life. We paid in 40 quarters, uh, we're eligible for premium free part A. But B is not going to be free. And now we're eligible for uh, a Medicare part B because we paid into those 40 quarters, but there will be a premium. Now this premium right now in 2023 is $164.90 for almost 93% of the Medicare population. This is what people are paying for their Part B premium. Uh, now, this is uh, taken out of your Social Security check if you're receiving Social Security benefits. But if you're not, what happens is you have a couple ways to pay for it. Number one, uh, this can be billed to you quarterly. So that would be times three, and you'll get a quarterly bill. Uh, if you don't want to do a quarterly bill and have to write a check to them, they actually have a system now called Medicare Easy Pay. And you provide uh, Medicare with a voided check. You fill out a form. It's an ACH form. Uh, and they will just do this bank draft on a monthly basis. They usually draft on the 20th of the month. So uh, if we're not on Social Security, uh, they'll bill us quarterly or we can set up this uh, Easy Pay and do a bank draft until we start taking Social Security. They'll stop the bank draft and then automatically take it out of your check. Now, so we know how it's paid for. We know exactly exactly the amount for those of you uh, that um, uh, are considered to be what Medicare would say just kind of standard income. That's what you're going to pay for your Part B. Now, I do want to explain how this works because I think it's essential for you to understand this. This number is just not just some random number. What happens is this. Uh, this is the 2023 number. So every year as they we move into the new year, Medicare uh, calculates what they believe it's going to cost them to cover uh, the average person for Medicare B benefits. Okay, And so uh, this is a process the uh, Department of Health and Human Services goes through, and then they uh, make this proposal. Of course, it has to be approved by Congress. But the point is, this number is actually 25% of what it costs the government, or at least it's an estimate for what it's going to cost the government to cover us for Part B services into 2023. And so this number represents 25%. So what that simply means is this, the government estimated in 2022 for the coming year that it would cost them uh, $630 a month to cover uh, the average person for Part B services. Remember all the doctor services, everything outpatient, as well as durable medical equipment. And so anyone uh, that is at a certain income level, and that income level is $97,000. Okay, and by the way, this is a single filer, somebody that files an individual tax return. So anyone that's at $97,000, and this number is called Modified Adjusted Gross Income. Okay, now, let me tell you what that is. The adjusted gross income, of course, on your tax return, um, and they modify it by adding back in tax-free or tax-exempt interest, typically municipal bond uh, uh, earnings. Uh, you you uh, make those earnings uh, as a return on your investment, uh, but those are not federally taxed. 
you report that number on your on your IRS return, uh, but there's no taxes uh, that you have to pay. And so the point is they're modifying it by taking AGI plus this tax exempt tax free interest, and those two numbers together represent the number that Medicare is going to look at to determine your Part B premium. So if I'm a single filer, my my uh, modified adjusted gross is ninety seven thousand or less. I pay that $164.90 uh, for my Part B premium. Now, if you're a married couple, you file a joint return, not a separate return, but a joint return. So we have married filing jointly. That number is $194,000 in modified adjusted gross income. So again, if I'm here or less, uh, each of you on Medicare would pay the $164.90. Now keep in mind, this is 2023. So when they look at this modified adjusted gross income, I'm over here in 2023, but they're looking back at what? 2021. They always look back two years. So in 2024, they're going to look back at 2022. And so they look back to determine what our Part B premium is going to be. And so 93% of the population are, is going to be below uh, these income thresholds. So they're going to pay, what, this $164.90 a month for their Part B premium. But 7% of the Medicare population is going to pay more. In other words, they're above these thresholds. So let me show you how that works. Hey, just real quickly, if you're finding this video to be helpful, you can like, comment, and subscribe. And if you do so, that'll let YouTube know that this is helpful information and they'll send it out to others who also need to learn about Medicare. So again, we're addressing those that would be determined to be classified as high income by Medicare. And so as we look at these uh, people that have high income, they're going to be charged, they're basically a surcharge, uh, something added to their Part B premium as well as to their drug plan as well. And the acronym I uh, used is called an IRMA, and that stands for Income Related Monthly Adjusted Amount. All right, so we all know that uh, everyone's going to have to pay the $164 .90 a month. Remember, that's the standard base premium. That's 25% of what it costs the government to, to provide these services, and the 75% that you're not paying is actually coming from the Medicare budget. They're, they're offsetting uh, the remaining a portion uh, from Medicare. So you pay 25, they pay 75. But as our income is above those thresholds, now we're gonna have to pay more. So as you can see from the chart, uh, those incomes, remember 97,000 or less as an individual filer or a couple married, married file a joint return, 194,000 or less. Uh, uh, there is no IRMA and there's nothing added to your Part D premium. You'll pay a premium, but they don't add an IRMA to it. But as we go above these numbers, now we have uh, five different levels of, of IRMA based upon in income schedules. And again, I'm not going to break down every one of these, but let's just talk about the very first one and then the last one. So we see that anyone that's an individual filer in the range of 97,000 to 123,000 or a married couple, 194 to 246, is going to have an IRMA. So for starting in 2023, they're going to look at 2021, 24, they'll look at 2022. So they're going to add $65.90 is going to be added to my Part B premium. All right. Uh, so that total obviously is going to go up by almost $66. So in that regard, we're looking at what, about $200, uh, $230 uh, as, as our Part B premium. In addition to that, uh, we're going to have an IRMA on the drug. So anytime we have an IRMA on the B, we're going to have an IRMA on the D. So this would be the Part D or the prescription drug plan. And these IRMAs are minimal, uh, but the government's saying we're not going to uh, cover all your expenses. You're going to have a surcharge. So they're going to add, again, $12.20 uh, to your Part D plan. So let's say you have a Part D plan that costs $20. Uh, you will have an additional $12.20, so your premium will be $32.20. If I have a drug plan that's $5, it's going to cost me the $17.20. So whatever the drug plan is, we add the IRMA to that as well. All right. And so that's at that income level. And you can kind of see as your income goes up, uh, these IRMAs are also going up. And here's basically what's happening. Remember what I taught you. At this level, uh, you're paying 25%, Medicare pays 75% out of the Medicare budget to cover those additional expenses. At this income level, what's happening, you're paying 35, they're paying now 65. So here, remember, uh, 25, 75. Here, you're paying 35. They pay 65. Here, it's 50, 50. You pay 50, they pay 50. Now here at this IRMA level, you're paying 65% of that cost. 
This IRMA level, 75% of the cost, and this highest uh, IRMA level, 85% uh, of the cost. So when we get down here and we're above 500,000 or we're above 750,000 as a couple, we're paying an additional $395 and we're paying about $76 for uh, our Part D. So total IRMA here is now pushing what? To about 400 and about $70 uh, on a monthly basis, all right, and being added because of our high income. And again, I know some of you, this may be news for you for the very first time. This could be disappointing. But I always remind people, hey, this is a wonderful problem to have. It just is. Uh, they're not taking all of your additional income, but they're going to take some just because you're at this uh, threshold level uh, where you have to pay more for your Part B and for your Part D. Now, uh, for many people, uh, these income levels stay up. They just uh, continue on even in retirement, maybe because of IRAs, 401ks, other investments. All those numbers go in uh, to your modified adjuster gross. But sometimes uh, people's, uh, their income is going to change change uh, when they retire. Uh, we call these life-changing events. And there are eight possible life-changing events. Now, the ones we primarily use would be um, work stoppage, which means you retired, work reduction, you semi-retired, or it could be uh, because of a death or because of a divorce or even because of a marriage. Those kinds of things are life-changing events. And when that event happens, we actually, for two years around that date, we can, if our numbers are changing and they're, and they're, they're being reduced uh, in income, uh, then we have the right to appeal our IRMAs. So if I'm on Medicare in 2023, they're looking back at 2021. But if I retire in 2023 and I'm going to be making less money, I can appeal the IRMAs. It's called an SSA 44 form that we fill out. And basically all we're saying is, hey, yeah, I know you all are looking at 2021, but I want you to look at 2023 and we'll give them the projection for what your income is going to be for 2023. And by the way, you want to be as accurate as possible. But when you make that projection, they'll say, okay, we won't look at 2021. You've had a life-changing event. Uh, that date has been within the last two years, and we can project for 2023. And again, if your income has changed, we can either drop off the IRMAs or reduce the IRMAs. And so that's called an IRMA appeal. And by the way, you work with us, we'll, we'll help you with all this. Uh, but the point is, anyone who's going to be considered a high income above these base thresholds will be paying an additional amount for their Part B premium, I'll add to the 164.90, and of course, for their drug plan as well an additional fee. Now next I'm going to deal with the topic of cost sharing. Cost sharing just simply means what are your out-of-pocket expenses uh, that you will incur while you're on Medicare getting the health care services that you need. All right, for, so before I get into that, I do want to make a quick comparison. When we talk about out-of-pocket expenses for um, uh, any kind of health care plan, uh, the first thing we have is, of course, is a premium uh, to be on the plan, right? And so we saw that we have $164.90 a month uh, for that Medicare Part B. Remember, A was free, B had the premium. And so when someone buys the reinsurance, again, they're going to have a premium for that, a supplemental plan, a drug plan. We have premiums for that. But beyond just paying premiums, we have additional out-of-pocket expenses. And that's specifically what I mean by cost sharing. So we have a couple different types of cost sharing. We have number one. One, we have deductibles. Now, what a deductible means, it means that you have to pay a certain amount of money, a $1,000 deductible, $500 deductible, whatever it is, you're going to pay that out of pocket first, and then the plan begins to pay. All right, so that deductible, you have to meet the deductible. So we have that as cost sharing. In addition to that, uh, we could have some co-pays for cost sharing. A copay is just simply a flat uh, dollar amount. We could have a $5 copay, a $20 copay, a $50 copay. And so we'll have some of those in Medicare. In addition, we also have cost sharing that is called coinsurance. And a coinsurance is always a percentage of the bill. Most of the things where you have cost sharing with Medicare, it's going to be 80% paid by Medicare, 20% paid by you. So that'll be out of your pocket, that percentage. And then also some plans as part of cost sharing uh, will set some type of a limit, an annual limit, which is called a max out of pocket. And so all that simply means as I'm doing my cost sharing, I pay my deductible, co-pays, co-insurance, all that's going to my, to my annual max out of pocket. And if I ever hit that annual max out of pocket, whatever that limit is, then I would be done. I'm, I'm done with cost sharing and then the plan pays 100% after that. All right. So those are the different types of cost sharing that we're going to talk about. All right. So let's go back through. Now let's talk about, again, just quickly, and I know this is primarily about Medicare B, where the biggest expenses are. But just as a reminder, when we have Medicare A, that's the inpatient side. And we also have cost sharing on the A side. And what that means, if I go to the hospital, it costs me cost sharing $1,600 deductible. 
I've got to meet that deductible on the A of Medicare. Now, one thing about this deductible, it can occur more than once in a year because it's tied to a hospitalization. Now, that's all I have to pay for a one to up to 60 day stay in the hospital, which is probably 99% of every situation. But if I'm in the hospital longer than 60 continuous days, now I have to start paying daily co-pays to the hospital. So this is day 61 to 90. Um, it costs me $400 a day copay. All right, month three, if I'm still in, I'm really sick, days 91 to 150, and now I have cost sharing that I have to meet, and that's gonna be $800 a day uh, out of my pocket. All right, and so that's the cost sharing for the hospital stay. Now, in addition to that, um, uh, Medicare Part A also covers skilled nursing facilities. So here's how that works. Medicare has a $200 a day copay that you're responsible for in the skilled nursing facility days 21 to 100. And the reason for that is Medicare says your first 20 days in the skilled nursing facility cost you zero out of pocket as long as you had a three day stay in the hospital. So they require a three day inpatient stay. Doctor can then put you in skilled nursing. They cover everything first 20 days. After that, if you're still in need of care, we have $200 a day. And so these items that I'm talking about here are your cost sharing on the A. Now let's talk about the details of Medicare Part B. Again, this is the outpatient side of Medicare. Medicare B also has a deductible. This year, 2023, it's $226. Now the good thing about this deductible, it is just simply once a calendar year. All right, and then this number resets every January. Uh, last year, 2022, this was actually $233. Actually went down a few dollars. So I'm responsible for the first $226 of anything coming through the B side of Medicare. All outpatient services, anything, uh, any doctor-related services or durable medical equipment. I pay the first $226. And after that deductible is met, now I'm going to go into, again, what we call coinsurance. Remember, Medicare pays 80% of the bill and you're responsible for 20%. So if that surgeon um, uh, has been approved for a $10,000 surgery, Medicare pays 8,000 and you're gonna pay 2,000, all right? And so that's your part and the bad, really the bad news about that part is that there's no limit to this whatsoever. It just keeps going and going and going. So all your cost sharing, there really is no limit to it whatsoever unless you get other insurance, all right? And then the last item is called an excess charge. So this is our last aspect of cost sharing on the B side, and that is when a doctor adds 15% to the bill. Uh, now, again, they say right now only about one out of 10 doctors on average actually add to the bill. Most don't. Uh, but those who do add to the bill are going to add 15%. And whenever they do that, you have to pay for that. So that's our final aspect. So as you can see, I have three uh, parts, uh, uh, three um, gaps, we call them. But we have three items that we're responsible for cost sharing on the B. And we also have three on the A. Now, the majority of people that stay in this system, original Medicare, uh, they're not interested and really in having to be out of pocket for all these uh, amounts of money. They don't like that liability. So what they will do is they will get other insurance to cover this so they'll have less cost sharing. All right. So that takes us into our next topic of other insurance. Hey, if you're looking for someone to help you hold your hand through this entire Medicare enrollment process, we would love to do that. Our team is standing by to help you. We help about a thousand people a month go from Medicare confusion to having their plans enrolled and it takes probably less than an hour. Go to the pinned comment below and you can book your appointment. The majority of people that uh, are on Medicare A and B uh, do not have A and B alone. They get additional insurance, uh, again, because of the gaps and the liability that you have in th that original Medicare system. So there's only really two ways uh, or two systems that are available to you to use your Medicare benefits. Uh, you have to choose one or the other. You cannot be on both at the same time. And these two systems really only have one thing in common, and that is this. Uh, uh, if you enroll in A and B, you can add what is called a supplemental plan. Uh, these are also called Medigap policies, right? We can have uh, uh, one option if, for our insurance with Medicare is that. Uh, the other one, uh, you have to be enrolled in A and B, but what happens, you actually get a replacement plan and you get a private health insurance company that issues to you what is called an Advantage plan. Uh, these are also called uh, C plans. 
Okay, and so these are your two different insurance options. And again, it's one or the other, and they're totally different. The thing they have in common is if I have a supplemental plan, I've got to be enrolled in A and B. If I have an advantage plan, again, I also have to be enrolled in, in A and B. A for most people is zero, but B has the premium. Remember this year, $164 and 90 cents a month, right? Comes out of your social security check or they bill you quarterly for this or do a bank draft. And so my whole point is these are ways that we can eliminate our cost sharing, ways that we can uh, reduce our liability, our financial risk and exposure uh, for healthcare services, okay? And so whenever we get a supplemental plan, about half of all people do that, half of the others get an advantage plan. And so when we get a supplemental plan, what we're doing is we're buying a plan to fill in the gaps. And when we uh, get that insurance, we're going to have to pay a premium to the insurance company so that we can transfer uh, the liability of those gaps to the insurance company. That's all we do when we buy any insurance. Uh, we transfer a liability for a car wreck, for a, our home burning down, and we get a policy from that insurance company. We pay them a premium to take the liability. And so you saw that on the A of Medicare, remember what we had? We had three gaps. On the B of Medicare, we also had three gaps. All right. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details of different plans because, frankly, 97% of all people or so buy one of three plans. Uh, they either get an F plan, they get a G plan, or they get an N plan. And what I want you to realize is that all three of those, the top three plans, have the same coverage when it comes to the A of Medicare. It will cover all three gaps. Uh, so whether you have an FG or an N plan, uh, all those gaps, we had the, the A deductible even multiple times a year. The extended hospital co-pays, extended skilled nursing co-pays are paid 100% by all of those plans. So there's no difference whatsoever. But the difference is, is on the B side of Medicare. Let's just, let's draw those out again real quickly. So what do we have? We had a deductible on the B of Medicare, remember? $226, and it is once a calendar year, resets every January. And then we had our coinsurance, remember that? Uh, your part is 20%, you gotta pay that. And then we had the possibility of an excess charge, and that is 15% that you're responsible to pay if and when a doctor does that. So when we talk about these different supplemental plans, these differ as it relates to how they cover these gaps. All right, so the first one is the F plan, and again, it covers all these gaps and those gaps, and so if you have an F plan, you actually have six of six gaps covered, which means anyone that's on an F plan really should never get a bill. If Medicare pays, that F plan is gonna follow filling all the gaps. That's why you should never get a bill. We tell folks uh, that are on F plans, if you get a bill, don't pay it. Call us, let's figure out what happened. All right. So it truly is a full coverage plan. Now, though we like full coverage, there's one issue with the F plan today, and that is that some people cannot buy it. Here's the rules. The key date is 1-1-1955. And also the key date is 1-1-2020, okay? And so anyone that was born before January 1st, 1955, therefore eligible for Medicare before January 1, 2020, can still buy F plans, and all those who, who have those F plans, millions of people, they get to keep their F plan. They were grandfathered in. But anyone born after January 1st, 55, starting Medicare after January 1, 2020, uh, F is not an option for you. And that was replaced really in popularity by the G plan. Again, it's a different letter different coverage um, uh, uh, by that plan. And so what it covers, it covers five of the six gaps. So when someone has a G plan, again, all the A gaps are covered 100%, but here's the difference. Here's our three gaps on the B. So that G plan will cover all of our coinsurance, it'll cover all excess, but it will not cover your B deductible. So that just simply means the first $226 on that G plan, uh, those bills coming to the B of Medicare, uh, they're gonna end up as a bill in your mailbox. You have to pay the first $226. After that, that plan pays 100%, and then that, that uh, B deductible, once satisfied, you're done for the year, and then in January, it'll reset. Remember when I said last year, uh, that B deductible was 233. So anyone in, who had a plan uh, in the year 2022 had to pay the first 226, I mean 233, excuse me, and now this year 226, and then we're done for the whole year. So it's almost full coverage. Obviously, because uh, we're, we're uh, responsible for one gap, the premium is going to go down as well. And then lastly, I just want to mention the end plan. It's definitely not as popular as the G plan today, but some take the end plan. Uh, and what it covers is four of the six gaps plus some copays. So here's the way it works. Remember what I said, F, G, and N all cover uh, the gaps on the A it, the same, but on the B side, what the N does is it will cover your coinsurance only. 
It will not cover excess and like the G, it will not cover the B deductible. Okay, so again, four of the six gaps are covered. Obviously, we're gonna have a little bit lower of a premium because we take on more liability. In addition to that, we do have some co-pays. Remember, we're talking about cost sharing. So we have co-pays uh, on that end plan, and that is anytime you go to a doctor, you're subject to up to a $20 copay. Anytime you go to the emergency room, you're subject to up to a $50 copay. So again, we got a lower premium, taking on the deductible, we take on excess if anyone occurs, and some co-pays as well. So these are the different ways in which people uh, will get that original Medicare A and B covered by those gaps. All right, now let's talk next about uh, the other option you have, which is A and B, and this would be an advantage plan. Let me show you how those work. So the key features of an Advantage plan, number one, they are called C plans or replacement plans. And again, we've got to be enrolled in A and B, which means what? We've got to pay our, our B premium, $164.90, unless your income is above those thresholds that we discussed. Now what happens with these C plans is a majority of them have a zero premium. In other words, you don't have to pay that insurance company any money to be on the plan. Now, some have a small premium, but most uh, have a zero premium because instead of paying a premium like we had to on that supplemental plan, now what we're going to do is we're going to have co-pays and we're going to have co-insurance and we're going to have with those eventually we'll hit possibly our max out of pocket for the year. So they're structured differently. Uh, Co-pays, uh, maybe $35 or $50 to see a specialist. Primary care docs are usually zero copay. Uh, copay to go to the hospital is usually about $300 to $350 a day, up to maybe five or six days for each hospitalization that you have during that year. If you have an MRI, it may cost you $150 to $250 copay. Uh, any kind of lab work, you may have a you know, $10, $20 copay. So the copays are very reasonable. If you have a knee replacement, outpatient surgery, probably cost you three to $400, but we're gonna pay for copays for the majority of services that we get. Some items, such as uh, usually chemotherapy, different things, we can have co-insurance. So again, the plan would pay 80%, you pay 20%. And then we also have, with all Advantage plans, a max out of pocket. And those max out of pockets range anywhere on an HMO, somewhere between about 2,500 to $5,000 for the year, and the PPO plans are going to be anywhere from usually about $3,000 uh, to maybe $7,000 a year um, on that plan. All right, so the whole point is our cost sharing does have a limit when we take an Advantage plan. And the difference is this Advantage plan is now a private health insurance company that replaces Medicare for you. They put together a network of doctors um, and a schedule of uh, co-pays you're responsible for until we hit our max out of pocket. So again, as it relates to premiums, normally going to be zero because instead of premiums, we have cost sharing instead. All right, only one other thing I want to mention as we talk about additional insurance as it relates to Medicare and premiums. If if I decide to take that A and B option, stay in original Medicare, and I get a supplemental plan, then I also am going to have to have a Part D plan for my prescriptions that I self-administer. And with these prescription plans, there's always going to be some kind of a premium uh, that we have to pay for that insurance. It could be as low as $5. I think the average right now is about $30 on a monthly basis. Okay, and so we have a premium that will be attached to that drug plan. Now again, I'm gonna have co-pays as well, may have to meet a deductible, that will be my cost sharing for the drug plan. So that's if I stay in original Medicare, get a supplemental plan, we're gonna add the drug plan. Now if I decide to get a C plan, that replacement plan, what's gonna happen is they will include a prescription drug plan, okay? And by the way, sometimes those prescription drug plans that are embedded with Advantage are really very good. Sometimes they're not so good, they're kind of mediocre. So you gotta always pay attention to that. But in this system, they include that and almost always at a zero premium. You don't have to pay for that, they'll add it. Now I'll still have maybe a deductible, some co-pays for my medications, but the premium itself then would be zero. And just remember, those of you that are high income, what are they gonna do? If I've got a premium, they're gonna add that IRMA uh, to uh, my uh, prescription drug plan here, even if it's zero, you still have to pay your IRMA based upon uh, that income level that you're at. Hey, if you want to learn more about Medicare, I want to invite you to join our uh, MedicareSchool.com Facebook group. Every Monday, Central Time, 5 o'clock, uh, we'll take a very important topic and get into the details of that. So if it's something that you would enjoy doing, we hope that you'll join us. All right, as we conclude, I, I do want to make sure that you're very clear that um, when you decide to go on Medicare, uh, you're probably going to want some, some sort of assistance, some kind of guidance. Okay, now, listen, there are some people uh, that will DYI, uh, they will do it themselves. 
Uh, and the reason they do it is because they feel like if they were to get additional help, they're a broker, an agent, uh, that they're going to have to pay more. And that absolutely is not accurate, okay? Uh, it doesn't matter whether you do it yourself or you get someone else, the premium for you and the, and the coverage, all that is going to be the same. Now, listen, I like do-it-yourself projects because I like to save money. But I will tell you, as you go on Medicare, you will not save any money whatsoever by doing it yourselves. As a matter of fact, if you make some wrong decisions along the way, uh, it could cost you uh, dearly, really, really could. So most people uh, are, are not going to be successful at doing it themselves. Not that you're not capable, uh, but there's a lot of rules, a lot of regulations, a lot of penalties, and so it can be very cumbersome, very confusing. And so do-it-yourself will not save you any money, could cost you a lot. So then what you have is you have the ability to get help from uh, what we call a captive agent a captive agent. And what this means, this is a, uh, an agent who works for one insurance company and they represent uh, that insurance company's portfolio products and most certainly that's what they're going to tell you is the best. In fact, all these uh, captive agents say they have the best. Well, the truth is no one really has the best because everyone's situation is different. One size doesn't fit all in the Medicare business. Uh, but the point is if you work with a captive agent, they are going to sell you uh, their, co their company's products and that's it. They're not going to give you any other options because they don't get paid unless you buy that company's product. All right, the second way in which you can do business and this is the model that we have chosen, and that is to be an independent broker. And the reason we have chosen this is because we know one size doesn't fit all. So what happens? We write for multiple companies. Now, there's no broker that writes for all of them. That would almost truly be impossible. But a company like us, we're looking for the, the top companies, the stable companies, those companies that we know provide good services, good coverage, and all that in all the markets throughout the country. So we offer multiple options. And the reason for that, since one size doesn't fit all. If you work for an, with an independent broker like us or someone else, then they're going to show you all those options. And also, uh, uh, many times you're not only going to get lots of options, but if they've been in the business a while, uh, they're going to give you wonderful help as well. So this captive agent primarily just pushing one company here. We're trying to evaluate your situation to see what's going to be very best for you and look at all those options, compare premiums, compare rate stability and the coverage of those plans to be sure that you enroll in the very best plan for you, not necessarily the best plan for the company. All right, and so these are the details as it relates to uh, getting your Medicare set up. Now keep this in mind, no matter who you use here, the price for your plan will all be the same. Okay, now the service could be different, the, the knowledge could certainly be different, but you're not going to save any money with any of these options, nor will you spend more money with any of these options. And all these options here, agents and brokers, uh, we don't work for free, but you don't have to pay us. Why? Because when we set up an insurance plan, that insurance company always pays the agent. Insurance companies set all the rates, and they always pay the agents. That's why I'm saying if you do it yourself, uh, there's really no benefit to you whatsoever.